Good afternoon, everybody. I welcome you to the launch of the European Clean Hydrogen Alliance. My name is Castignana. I'm heading the Internal Market Department in the European Commission. And my role is to moderate the event today and walk you through the program. We have a great lineup of 20 speakers, representatives of civil society, CEOs of different sectors and industry, ministers, commissioners, representatives of regions, and they will tell us about their aspirations, their motivations, their projects with regard to hydrogen and beyond. Let's start with setting the scene at European level. The European Commission today adopted the European strategy for hydrogen. And I'm very happy to welcome Executive Vice President Timmermans, Commissioner Breton and Commissioner Simpson, who are joining us. And without further ado, I would like to kick off the event and give the floor to Executive Vice President Franz Timmermans. He is leading on the European deal and on our efforts to make Europe a climate neutral continent by 2050. Executive Vice President, you have the floor. Thank you very much for offering me this opportunity. I am really excited about this alliance. I believe we need it. When we came up with the European Green Deal, it was because we knew we wanted to be the first climate neutral continent by 2050. And to get there, we would have to restructure our economy, our society, and we wanted to create a roadmap for that. We did that. Then, of course, we were hit by the COVID-19. We thought this would sort of diminish our sense of urgency, but in fact, it has increased our sense of urgency. I'll keep it short. You know, the, the, the essence is, why do we need hydrogen? And the essence is that we want to re reach climate neutrality uh, by 2050. We need to move fast with our renewables, but not everything can be electrified. In some sectors, difficult to abate sectors, we will need another energy and a carbon-free energy source. And hydrogen, to me, is the ideal. It is ideal because... It can be used for storage, it can be used to create things like green steel, it can be used to decarbonize very difficult to abate sectors, whether it's in the chemical area or it's in the cement business, you name it, you know all of them. It, it could also help us overcome some of the issues we have with renewable energy, solar and wind, in terms of storage of, of, of the last. We saw in the last couple of days that the for energy became negative because of an overcapacity that could not be stored. And hydrogen is a great solution for that as well. Uh, well, many of you, we have spoken already, we've met over the last couple of months. You all know my commitment to hydrogen as a solution for many of our issues. You all know that I know that we need to bring the price down. So we need to do something about our production capacity. We need to do something about storage and transport. And we need to do something about the market, about the end users of hydrogen. So all in these three elements. Uh, I think uh, the strategy we've presented also has answers. But we will only be successful in this if we finance quickly the right projects. That's the only way we will get to six gigawatts in four years and we will get to 40 gigawatts, hopefully two times 40 gigawatts, by 2030. And that's where the alliance comes in. We need you to channel to us the projects that are in line with our objective and that can be financed and that could lead to quick results. This is what we want to achieve. That's where you come in. But let me be very clear. We want all the stakeholders, all the stakeholders to be part of this conversation. In my experience uh, working at the Commission also in the last five years, the best proposals are made by the Commission if they are assessed for impact and if everyone who has a stake in it has their say and their influence on the end product, which is a Commission proposal. So that's also my plea to you. Make sure that all stakeholders are part of this conversation and can have their input, even if there are deep disagreements. That's not the problem. The problem is that if we don't listen to all the voices, we will not be able to present the best possible projects. This is my call to you. My door will always be open. You know how much I believe in this project and I believe in hydrogen as part of the solution for our need for climate neutrality. And I want to thank Thierry Breton for a job extremely well done in bringing this together. I want to thank Kadri Simpson for working with us so closely in presenting our dual and working on our dual strategies. And I want to encourage all of you to be very clear as far as your commitments are concerned. Then we can make this happen. You know, hydrogen rocks. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Vice President. And you've already given the key word, Thierry Breton. You're the Commissioner for the Internal Market, and you play a key role for the green and digital transition of our economy. How will we make it happen, this partnership? The floor is yours. First, I would like to welcome uh, each of you uh, again from my side and thank you very much, friends, for your kind words and more than that for your dedication to this ambition, to this fight and uh, for your leadership in this uh, 2050 ambition that we all are willing to realize for our continent. And of course, in this ambition, you said it, France, hydrogen is definitely essential and this is why we're extremely happy to announce and to launch today the Clean Hydrogen Alliance. Because, of course, it is essential to decarbonize our industry, especially but not only in uh, energy-intensive sectors. We spoke, France, together about steel. We want to produce steel in Europe, but we know that it will be important to decarbonize it. And this is, of course, the right tool to do it, the right vehicle. Chemicals and, of course, also for the whole mobility ecosystem. So hydrogen is not only a vehicle to achieve our climate goals and support our green ambition, it is also a mean to ensure our international leadership, generate quality and sustainable jobs, of course, also, and uh, contribute to a more resilient economy. The Alliance plays, of course, a key role in turning our ambition into today's reality. So we announced the intention to launch this Alliance in the new industrial strategy. You remind this, it was uh, at the beginning of uh, March. But our policy objectives remain, of course, unchanged after the coronavirus crisis. And in fact, the crisis has strengthened our commitment to the Green Deal and accelerated the need for a green and digital and resilient recovery. So this morning, we presented an ambitious hydrogen strategy. And thank you, Kadri, for, for being so instrumental in it. And of course, this alliance this afternoon will help to make it happen on the ground. It will, of course, channel the necessary investment into hydrogen production and develop, which is extremely important, a pipeline of concrete projects. Because to master the challenge ahead of us, we need to work together. And with the global competition moving fast, we need to act now, as uh, France just mentioned. This is why we are so happy to, uh, to have all of you today around this announcement. But again, this is a co-ownership and an inclusiveness of the alliance that we all want. Each level of the value chain, each player of the market must be included and uh, involved in this alliance because there is no rationale for producing hydrogen if there is no way to store and to transport or if no company wants to use it. At the same time, energy-intensive sectors cannot convert to carbon-neutral ways of production without having the guarantee of supply. So for it to be successful, the alliance must, above all, be increasing, as I say, and share cooperation at all levels. I'm talking, of course, of member states, companies, but also local authorities, NGOs, trade unions, civil society, and so on. And all the stakeholders involved are represented at uh, this kickoff meeting, and we are launching an open call to join the Alliance. Any European organization whose activities have a significant interest in low carbon hydrogen will be able to join at any time by signing the European Clean Hydrogen Alliance Declaration. So in order to turn the Alliance into a tangible success, we also need each other's full commitment to fully engage behind it and to produce results quickly. Our key objective, of course, is an investment agenda for an ambitious deployment of clean hydrogen technologies by 2050, bringing together all components of the value chain. The targets are clear. From producing 6 gigawatt by 2024, we will need to reach 40 gigawatt of renewable hydrogen electrolyzer by 2030. And of course, we will have to scale up ourselves to that. The stakes are high. By 2050, there could be between 180 and 470 billion euros of investment in renewable hydrogen compared to 3 to 18 billion for low carbon fossil <coughs> based hydrogen. So we are speaking about up to 1 million jobs in Europe. We are not afraid of the challenge because I know I can rely on you, your dynamism and of course your commitment. So today we are eager to hear your expectations, ambitions and concrete proposals for actions and of course to engage with you and other participants of the Alliance on a more regular basis at the Hydrogen Forum to make progress of uh, this journey. So there is a lot of work ahead of us. Hopefully, uh, together with my colleague, uh, Franz Timmermans and Kadri Simpson, I, I really and we, uh, we uh, the three of us, count on your active involvement.
both the participants in this virtual room and, of course, all the stakeholders following us by uh, uh, web streaming. So thank you and uh, eager to participate to this uh, debate and conversation today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. And uh, I just got the information that almost 1,300 participants are in the virtual room and listening to us. Let's turn to Commissioner Kadri Simpson. You are in charge of energy policy. And what we've heard is that hydrogen is pretty much the joker in the energy toolbox. Would you like to share some thoughts with us on this? Thank you. Thank you, and ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. You have just heard uh, from my colleagues, uh, Franz Timmermans and Thierry Breton, about the significance of today's launch. I want to tell you uh, how this new alliance fits into our vision for a new strategy for hydrogen in Europe. So since uh, this commission took office, we have had our sights set on reaching uh, net zero emissions in Europe within 30 years. That gives us one generation, more or less, to lead Europe towards full decarbonisation and eventual climate neutrality. When it comes to energy, we are already making huge strides, especially in the power sector, which is decarbonising rapidly. By 2030, almost 76% will come from low-carbon sources. But electricity alone cannot get us there. Other carriers have been waiting in the wings and today we have launched our strategy so that the most stable contender, hydrogen, can enter the stage. Hydrogen is a young industry, but unlike most parents, we want to grow up uh, as quickly as possible. And we aim to go for, from the current production of mostly fossil fuel-based hydrogen to 10 million tonnes of renewable hydrogen in a single decade. And from less than 2% today, to around 13% of clean hydrogen in our energy mix by 2050. What we presented earlier today is our vision for how to make that happen in three decades. What we presented earlier today is divided into three phases. First, we scale up supply and demand for hydrogen. On the supply side, our most urgent need is electrolyzers with bigger capacities. Many are already in the works. Just two days ago, I visited Köln, where the world's largest PEM hydrogen electrolyzer plant using only renewable electricity is being built. But still, we need to go bigger. And later this year, we will launch a call for a 100 megawatt electrolyzer as part of the European Green Deal call under Horizon 2020. Meanwhile, last Friday, we launched an innovation fund call, including new hydrogen technologies. On the demand side, we need to open the door to new applications. We will work on common standards, certifications and de terminology while piloting a carbon contract for difference program to facilitate the use of clean hydrogen in steel and chemical production, but also in some transport sectors. The second step for our hydrogen strategy is based on market and infrastructure. We need to shape an open and competitive market with uh, unhindered cross-border trade and infrastructure to transport hydrogen to exactly where it's needed. This could mean a potential repurposing of some of the existing natural gas infrastructure and avoiding stranded assets. By the end of this year, we will revise the DENI regulation with a view to making this happen. And the third step will be our ongoing work on the international dimension of hydrogen. Soon we will see a global surge in interest in renewable hydrogen and we want Europe to be leading the pack in electrolyzer production when that happens. And industrial transformation on this scale has never existed in vacuum and hydrogen won't be an exception. Operation will be a key, especially with our neighbours in East and South, to ensure global standards and the global rules-based market for hydrogen. The hydrogen strategy is not a top-down project. It is based on the idea that private and public sector have to come together so that we can write a success story. So the launch of today's European Hydrogen Alliance is the first step to promote an inclusive ecosystem around hydrogen production. And we want to bring the full value chain of hydrogen together. So investors, governmental, institutional and industrial partners, local authorities and civil society to involve all actors to accelerate hydrogen deployment. We look forward to the work uh, the Alliance will deliver, and in particular, a pipeline of projects that can attract 
the funds of the recovery plan and translate today's policy objectives into the industrial reality of tomorrow. I see this alliance as the leg on which our policy strategy will run. And I will lend to Commissioner Breton and to the participants to the alliance all my support to make this partnership a great success. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. You mentioned three steps, but in fact there are very many small steps behind it. And that takes us actually to the question, how will industry walk the talk? You've heard now from the expectations, and it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Giorgio Tsetsimakakis, who is the Secretary General of Hydrogen Europe, and who will tell us about how the industry sees things and how they will make it happen on the ground. Giorgio, please. Many thanks. Justin, I hope you can see now myself in the presentation. Just let me um, express my gratitude for this morning's uh, launch of the hydrogen strategy and also the uh, energy systems integration package. I think both are elements that uh, this hydrogen alliance can play a very substantial role in. Of course, it's a great day for hydrogen. We are today kickstarting the EU hydrogen industry to achieve the climate goals. I represent Hydrogen Europe, which is the leading association when it comes to hydrogen technologies. You see that we have more than 200 members. Many national associations are represented. Let me start with the seventh generation principle. So the U.S. Indian tribe of the Iroquois, when they decided already many hundred years ago political decisions, they wanted to consider the impact of decisions on the next seven generations. I think that today we see this historical dimension of the day because today with these three elements, energy systems integration, hydrogen strategy, and the launch of this alliance, we start really to think about the future generations. And we regard this as very, very important. Now, COVID has hit quite hard energy sector. This chart here from the IEA shows that uh, the energy demand has gone down dramatically. And only the renewables could show that their share became bigger. So total energy demand, of course, went down. We think this is the time where we have to scale solar and wind resources. And I'm extremely happy to see both of my colleagues from the solar industry, Walburga Hemmetsberger, and from wind industry, Giles Dixon, here in that meeting present. And Walburga will take the floor later on. But we also need, and that has already been highlighted by Franz and by Kadri both, to have more pipelines, more backbone, hydrogen dedicated backbones, and to store this energy using, for example, salt currents, you see that they are represented all over Europe. This is the time where the term hydrogen renewables could be born. So the combination of uh, renewables that are immediately turned into hydrogen and uh, using the pipelines brought to shore. Why is it so? Hydrogen and that we have discovered, I think, the last years, is more than just a fuel. I'm using it every day in my hydrogen car as a fuel. No, it's an energy vector that allows storage, but it's also a chemical feedstock. I have seen this morning how fascinated people reacted to green steel. Yes, hydrogen can turn the steel production process into a sustainable process. We are here to scale it up. Kadri mentioned it how to scale it up. And the 2 times 40 gigawatt initiative that was proposed by us beginning of this year was maybe one of the basis to understand that it is possible to become global leader, not only in electrolysis. We added the hydrogen 2030 blueprint. So what we want to do is, and we are happy to see this also in the strategy, to come up immediately with the upscale and to produce 1 million ton of renewable hydrogen until 2024. So this is within the mandate of this commission in order to then see faster acceleration, 10 million tons until 2030. And from there on, it will go exponential. This would mean 100 million tons of CO2 abatement in 2030, which is 5% of the overall 2030 target. In this hydrogen 2030 blueprint, we have described how this goes, but we need to see it coherently. We had the vision, we saw the vision, the two times 40 gigawatt, not only in Europe, but also in our neighborhood, Ukraine, and uh, also Northern Africa, places where we are going to do it. We see the cost in our hydrogen blueprint. We describe the cost as 430 billion, not cost, investment, 430 billion 
investments into hydrogen technologies, whereby one third would be public help. The rest is private investment coming, stemming from industry as one of one major example, the North H2 project, Shell, Hasuni, and also Port of Ems show it's 15 billion of investment into offshore wind mainly, which shows that this hydrogen renewable idea becomes reality. But also the commitment is important. You see here the commitment of uh, most uh, of our members. So 110 CEOs have signed the letter to support not only the alliance, but also the plan to implement uh, this hydrogen strategy. This goes along, of course, with some political recommendations, which are already also part of the strategy presented this morning. Now, what does it mean in figures? We believe that in only in electrolyzer production, if we really implement now immediately the two times 40 gigawatt, 170,000 jobs could be created just in the electrolyzer business, cumulative, of course, not every year. And you see here how this breaks down into investments into the different technologies. What strikes most is that the biggest part of the investment goes, of course, into uh, renewables. So into solar and wind, more wind in Europe, more solar in Northern Africa. And this is how we break down the costs. Here you see the costs for the infrastructure. It's an infrastructure that uses existing pipeline systems. Very happy to later on hear Marco Alvera talking about this, representing a little bit the, this uh, dissemination part of the value chain. But we also need to invest uh, into refueling stations, hydrogen refueling stations in port facilities, because ports will be the hubs where hydrogen will land, also imported from outside Europe. And of course, storage. So the salt cover and storage, there is a cost, but it allows us to better integrate renewable energy into the system. Now, the applications that we were talking about already, steel production until 2030, 8 billion might help to make steel greener, not all of it, but big parts of it, 10% of the total steel production already. Synthetic kerosene, some member states, Peter Altmaier will speak later on, and Germany builds very much on that synthetic kerosene for aviation, 3 billion. Mobility applications, very happy to listen to Monsieur Menego, the CEO of Michelin, to talk about the mobility applications, 40 billion, including trucks, including trains and heavy and light duty vehicles. But also heating, residential heating with 34 billion gives opportunities to really, really scale up. And of course, power balancing with 5 billion. This is the time and this should be the mission of this Hydrogen Alliance to deliver. We are dedicated as hydrogen industry to deliver for the European Green Deal and within the context of next generation EU. Happy to see that the alliance is already mentioned in the communication on the next generation EU. What we are about to do here is to implement the blueprint that we have presented. So to create a pipeline of concrete projects, to create also a sphere of trust for fast decision making. Many people ask, why is it industry led and why do you have CEOs foreseen for that? Because we need fast decisions. We are happy that we see the backing, high level backing of the European Commission. But in fact, we also see that there are fields in which we need to invest where there is no legislation. Kadri alluded to the upcoming legislation, but until this legislation enters into force, I think the mandate of this uh, commission might already be over. So we need to use these four years to create case-by-case -case decisions, case law, and this needs trust. And that's what we are going to create here. So the deliverables are large-scale investment projects, a roadmap addressing the main challenges and bottlenecks. But the keys of success is the leadership of the industry. It's important. I hear what Franz said in the beginning on the NGOs. They are extremely important in this process, and we listen and we are in a dialogue to them too. On the other hand, we need industry to reshape, to begin a new era. And this is possible with the help of NGOs, but also with this leadership of CEOs. We need to implement the ambitious vision for a hydrogen backbone. We want to give with this Hydrogen Alliance a strategic advice on this case-by-case -case approach. We want to experience or to take this experience also to impact the legislative process. And we want to have financial engineering, so a tailored financial aspect. The structure of the Hydrogen Alliance is to be on pillars, on round tables. What you see on the left hand is the main part of this alliance. So it's the value chain of the hydrogen technology divided into six parts. So hydrogen production, then the transport, the transmission of and distribution of hydrogen. 
and then the use in mobility, in residential applications, in industrial applications, but also in energy sector applications. We would be extremely happy to see very soon CEOs registering for that. But at the same time, there will be a policymakers platform on national and regional level. And the civil society is key, needs to be integrated. There will be steering meeting to see, to overlook the progress that will be done. And at the same time, there will be once per year, at least an annual hydrogen alliance forum with many, many people uh, represented. So this European Clean Hydrogen Alliance is about joining this six pillar round tables. Of course, you have to sign a declaration. Commissioner Breton was clear on that. And you will find all these specificities on the website, which is on by today. And we want to prepare as soon as possible for these roundtables. The IPSAI, the important projects of common European interest, are a very good start. We launched this together with DG Grow, cast in with your services last October already. It was extremely successful. We have already gathered a pipeline of concrete projects. And we are happy to integrate this process into this. To Peter Altmaier, I would like to say thanks for taking over the coordination of the IPSAI with the German government. We are eager to continue the very, very good cooperation we have with you. Some could do's in the end. We need, of course, to define a clear terminology on what is clean hydrogen. So that is something that is already part of your strategy. Happy to see so. Who knows whether the benchmark of 1.8 gram might be an interesting benchmark. I put a question mark there. But the carbon content of hydrogen will be the new currency. And we will need to see where the hydrogen comes from. So a clear and robust and transparent tracing and tracking system. Really happy to work together with our friends from the solar and from the wind industry on that. We also want to have a hydrogen market design. So Europe could be the birthplace of the first global hydrogen market with hydrogen as a new commodity to be traded globally. We believe that Europe is good in that. If we come up with clear regulation, then we will also be the leading place, not only in electrolyzer technology, but also in regulation. Why should the ton of hydrogen not be denominated in euro rather than dollar, yen or any other currency? Also, it's very important to be clear on the infrastructural ambitions. Uh, Kadri alluded to it already, that what the EU can do will be done, and that's key. We need to have a better link between the pipeline system, but also the corridors, the 10T corridors for automotive. This is why we are looking forward to the guidelines that you are going to come up with end of this year. Don't forget innovation. We need to continue our efforts in being innovative. We are looking forward to the next Clean Hydrogen Partnership, so the continuation of our joint undertaking. Yeah, in the end, the financial engineering will be the most important thing. There are so many different possibilities to really help these projects to become a reality. And that's what we are trying to do. And we think that the European Clean Hydrogen Alliance is the best place to do it. So thanks very much again. It was an honor to help this Hydrogen Alliance launch event to become a reality. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you very much, uh, Jorgo. Um, I've learned a new word, uh, hydrogen nubles. That's when green meets blue. You've heard in all the interventions so far the key concept of togetherness. And of course, togetherness, that means also the participants organize their way. Jorgo presented to us the, what I would say is the business plan of the alliance. And uh, the fact of working together really shows us that we have to look beyond borders, physical borders, sectoral borders, intellectual borders, to get going. It's now a pleasure for me to welcome four of our economics and energy ministers in Europe who will share with us their views and their motivations and expectations why they are participating and supporting the venture. The first speaker will be Mr. Peter Altmaier from Germany. Germany is currently holding the council presidency. Congratulations still for this uh, big job. And you have expressed clear ambitions for hydrogen, including hydrogen strategy in Germany. Herr Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Good afternoon to everybody in um, this uh, conference, but also listening and uh, watching the stream. I would like, first of all, to congratulate the Commission for organizing the um, presentation of the hydrogen strategy and this conference at the same day. This is uh, very important to uh, stress the um, general importance of uh, the issue. I'm now involved in European politics for more than 30 years. And on a national as well as on a European level, 
We have a tendency, or there is even a need, to produce uh, papers, strategies, plans, legislation all the time. And uh, most of the pieces are really useful and important. But from time to time, we take decisions that are important not just for the day or the month or the year where they are adopted. They are important uh, for decades, and they are constituted in a new era. For example, when we look back at the um, common market in the 50s, the internal market, the Schengen area, the German decision phasing out from nuclear electricity production or our decision to engage in climate neutrality by 2050. All these decisions are of a historic dimension. And in order to meet the requirements of such a historic dimension, we have to be serious about it. We have to be serious about it, and that means um, we um, have uh, not just the task to produce more paperwork, but we have the task to produce more results, concrete results. As we have done, and um, it's a big honor, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether Bruno Le Maire, who has been confirmed and strengthened in his job as Minister of Finance and, and the Economy in France, is participating in the conference. But um, Bruno Le Maire, myself, and Commissioner Shevkovic, we were at the beginning of a European battery strategy where we successfully managed to create IPCIs, IPSES, for a relaunch of battery cell production in Europe after many decades, where this was a monopoly for companies and um, uh, countries uh, in Asia. So, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, there are uh, hundreds and thousands of the ideas. What you can do with hydrogen, how you can produce it, store it, distribute it, uh, use it, this is important, and we need, of course, competition of ideas, and at the end of the day, the better ideas will make it, but at the same time, we have to provide guidance, clear guidance. We have to identify the priorities, and we have to provide the instruments to achieve our targets. And therefore, I believe hydrogen is uh, the missing link in order to achieve climate neutrality by 2050. Nothing more, nothing less. It's a missing link because without clean industry, without an industrial revolution, the green revolution will never ever be successful. If we want to achieve it by 2050, if we want to revise our 2030 climate targets, then, of course, we have to accelerate the transition in the field of the business uh, sector. And therefore, I welcome all these uh, initiatives. And I can promise that Germany, as the acting presidency of the European Union, will actively and wholeheartedly support the work of all of you, and especially this alliance during its uh, presidency. We will see a new infrastructure emerging an infrastructure of production and distribution, a new infrastructure for um, practical use. And of course, it will cost a lot of money and it will create a lot of added value. And all this makes it um, even more important. I'm very grateful to um, George Chatsimakakis, who has been in the past, by the way, a citizen of uh, my constituency in Saarland, Jorga has uh, mentioned the need to organize so-called IPCIs on hydrogen, IPSES, important projects of common European interest. This is exactly what we need. We have done it in the past with regard to semiconductors. It was a good success. We have done it, or we are doing it now, with regard to battery cell production. It's a huge success. Germany will initiate a process where we can have it with regard to 5G technologies, but also and especially with regard to hydrogen. And therefore, the Clean Hydrogen Alliance can provide a crucial momentum in this process by bringing the member states and the private sector, the companies, closer together by promoting the ideas and by taking action. I welcome the idea of an IPCI, and I, and I will and I can confirm this afternoon that Germany is prepared to organize and to coordinate the efforts uh, of so many in order to make the uh, IPSE a big success.
we will have to um, decide on difficult issues. For example, when green steel becomes a real thing, when um, civil aviation, by using hydrogen, clean hydrogen, becomes uh, climate neutral aviation, then the question will be raised, how can it be produced and sold at affordable, at competitive costs? Because we still will have to compete with gray and dirty steel from other regions in the world, and we have to make sure that we have the impact assessment Franz Timmermans has mentioned, but at the same time, we have sufficient instruments to protect the green technologies and the green products and to enable them to compete on a global scale. As better we do it, as sooner others in other regions and continents will follow our example. I wish you good luck. I wish all of us good luck. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Minister, and thank you for that we can count on you for the presidency, which is in fact a key word because we can now turn to the incoming presidency from Portugal and Secretary of State Mr. João Galamba, very active on hydrogen already. I understand you are already looking at concrete investment projects. Would you like to share with us uh, your experience on this? Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. As a, as a member of the Portuguese government, I'm truly honored to address the president here today for the launch of this common strategic project, the European Clean Energy Alliance. Today, it's an extremely important day for Europe's energy transition ambition, in particular for hydrogen. And we, I want to congratulate the European Commission for such an important set of initiatives. Deep decarbonization presents us, both as countries and as EU members, with a unique set of challenges, for sure, but mainly opportunities. Opportunities that we, as Europeans, must firmly embrace, looking into the future together. The following must always be said. The climate crisis is also an industrial and technological opportunity for the European Union and all its member states. And the Clean Hydrogen Alliance illustrates this perfectly. I'm certain that this alliance will highly contribute to the development of the hydrogen economy in Europe by aggregating relevant stakeholders, by pooling tremendous resources to increase scale and drive prices down, and by having a unique collective focus and drive we can accelerate the implementation of green hydrogen economy, create a full hydrogen value chain in Europe, and ensure global industrial and technological leadership. I am also certain that a small, uh, average actually in European terms, and periphery country from Southern Europe like Portugal, having an active role within this alliance will be a key element to push forward the broad use of hydrogen. More importantly, this is a textbook example of how a common project can perfectly embody one of the EU's biggest ideals, a common market, where all committed participants benefit precisely from a collective effort. This is particularly relevant in the hydrogen ecosystem, where each individual stake, each goal or each strategy are meaningful only and deliverable only within a wider context and as part of a common effort. This is why the term alliance is the correct designation for what we are launching today. Only as a whole, we may achieve our ambitious goals. The transition to a new and integrated energy system is a clear opportunity for the development of new business models, more sustainable, more resilient, and aligned with the long-term objectives of carbon neutrality. Portugal's national hydrogen strategy perfectly matches the European Commission's vision for hydrogen and for smart sector integration. As an ambitious and innovative country with a robust track record in renewables, we bring forward our commitment and our current state of play in the hydrogen field. We want to produce large amounts of green hydrogen. We want to produce it competitively, and we want to play a relevant role in the emerging hydrogen economy aligned with the industrialization strategy around hydrogen. These are objectives that can only be truly achieved in the context of an alliance. Portugal is already committed to the European effort on clean hydrogen. If the 2019 solar auction, we achieve results that exceeded our expectations, this year we dare to go further, and promoters will already be able to deploy storage solutions, including, of course, hydrogen fuel cells. We will have the basic legal and regulatory framework to allow production, storage, transfer, distribution, and consumption of hydrogen published before the end of August. Also this year, we will launch a 40 million euro or plus call to support clean hydrogen investment projects in Portugal. We intend to replicate this every year until 2030. 
Several municipalities in Portugal already have clean hydrogen projects that involve local production of clean hydrogen, refueling stations, and hydrogen power buses for public transportation. Actually, Portugal produces hydrogen powered buses in a company with a partnership with Toyota in the north of Portugal, Cretano Bus. Other projects or ongoing or planned are referenced in our national hydrogen strategy and encompass most elements of the clean hydrogen value chain. Another example of this commitment to the clean hydrogen economy is the large scale industrial project in Sinus. We want to leverage our highly competitive natural renewable resources, mainly sun and wind, and the geographical location is Sinus, a deep seaport that is currently the main fossil energy hub of the country. And we want to present a cluster of projects that can encompass most elements of the hydrogen value chain to produce, store, transport, use, and export green hydrogen at an industrial scale. The Portuguese government recently opened a call of expression of interest from the two projects that can fit and that can contribute to this vision and that can improve the contribution of Portugal to European-wide integrated value chain and make hydrogen export a reality. There are other initiatives involving European and Portuguese companies that can be a benchmark for the development of world-class projects in hydrogen, such as the production of climate-neutral synthetic hydrocarbons to be used in aviation. One particular project involves the construction of an industrial-scale power-to-liquid plant involving German, French, and Portuguese companies. Our national strategy states a goal of at least two gigawatts of electrolyzers until 2030. Within a European alliance that creates the conditions for long-distance transport and trade of green hydrogen, as well as the financial support mechanisms to kickstart this critical element of a functioning hydrogen economy, Portugal can commit to go beyond its initial goals and commit to more ambitious production targets that fit European demand and European ambitions. But this is something that we cannot commit to individually. Increased ambition is a reality that only close cooperation and collective commitment can deliver. The next decade will be a unique opportunity for the European Union to demonstrate that the decarbonization of the energy system is not only a necessity, but also and mainly an opportunity. By leveraging on and optimizing all renewable electrification strategies, green hydrogen was the missing link for decarbonization to become a possibility, at the same time that it presents Europe with a real and unique industrial opportunity. The hydrogen economy is a clear example of how the European Union's climate and industrial goals are part of the same vision, the vision so aptly put forward in the Green Deal. Let me highlight three important messages before I finish. The production of green hydrogen will facilitate the penetration of renewables and accelerate the decarbonization of various sectors, namely heavy transport and industry. Green hydrogen is thus a critical element in Europe's decarbonization strategy with a clear synergies with electricity produced from renewable sources. In particular, Portugal presents favorable and unique conditions to develop a green hydrogen economy. We have the right resources, we have very competitive conditions both for solar and wind, and a strategic geographical location that facilitates exports to the main consumption sites located in Northern Europe. Since individually we will not succeed, we must commit collectively to European industrial policy around clean hydrogen that coordinates and mobilizes public and private investment in projects of production, storage, transportation and consumption of renewable gases in Europe. Hence, the European Hydrogen Alliance is critical for individual and collective success. In sum, for all those reasons, we strongly support the creation of this alliance and also believe that Portugal can play a decisive role within this strategic partnership. We are the perfect partner for a trustful cooperation and the perfect country to share the forefront of hydrogen policy coordination and implementation. Finally, as a committed partner from a welcoming and sunny country, we can be an excellent ambassador for this strategy to countries outside of the EU. To finalize, let me finish by saying that it is time to elevate to an unprecedented level Europe's motto, not only united in diversity, but also united in adversity. It is time to forge new partnerships and new bridges between North and South, East and West. There is no Europe without all of us, truly embedded with the spirit, and we really need unity to tackle the challenges ahead. If we press on hard today, if we all make the right decisions with no fear of failure, if we understand that decarbonization is not a cost, I repeat, not a cost, but an industrial and technological opportunity, if we understand that the risk of a bold action is far lower than the costs of not acting bold enough, and of course, if we do it together in the context of this alliance, Portugal is certain that we will succeed and achieve our common and ambitious goals.
Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Minister. And I see we can count on you also for your presidency to support uh, the project. I would now like to turn to uh, Minister Nedela from the Czech Republic, who is experimenting with a lot of interesting, uh, I understand, uses of hydrogen and different applications. Minister, would you like to join us? Yes. So first of all, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm honored to speak here today at the beginning of the EU Clean Hydrogen Alliance. I believe this long-awaited platform will not only help uh, to direct investments where they are needed the most, but it will also provide guidance to the industry. We also appreciate the expected publication of the European Commission communication on the hydrogen strategy. We recognize hydrogen as an energy career which can help us reach ambitious targets of the European Green Deal and decarbonize our industry. Although hydrogen promises huge potential for del delivering our climate goals, the technologies are still young and need to be carefully forced. In order to leave the doors open for new technologies, we should support all zero or low carbon sources of hydrogen. There are promising technologies, for example, hydrogen production in high temperature reactors or from the waste. Similar new technologies can boost the whole hydrogen market. In the Czech Republic, we are uh, intensively monitoring technological development in all segments of hydrogen value chain. Our plan is to use step-by-step -step implementation to achieve the most cost-effective solution to fully explore the potential of hydrogen for reaching climate neutrality and to avoid stranded assets, we must set a stable regulatory framework for investors. It is clear that at the beginning, we need to support hydrogen technologies to be competitive with ones based on fossil fuels. The investment support scheme should take into account costs, effectiveness and the monetary value of the particular project. We need to find areas where the usage of hydrogen can be market-driven and where the initial impulse can stimulate the substantial growth of the technology. In history, the similar process was highly successful in technologies like railway, cars or mobile phones. Apart from heavy industry, where the potential of low-carbon hydrogen is indisputable, we must not forget other sectors which can also benefit from hydrogen technology development. When we compare the highest emitting sectors, the economic break-even point of hydrogen is very favorable in transport. Introduction of hydrogen to heavy-duty trucks and buses can be done in small incremental steps, which gives us a chance to use the newest technologies and avoid stranded assets. The key to effectiveness is the alignment of production, distribution and consumption of hydrogen. There are already running programs for the construction of hydrogen filling station in the Czech Republic and by 2025 we should have the sufficient hydrogen filling station network. We already started a discussion on how to gradually replace hydrogen from natural gas in the petrochemical industry by hydrogen from renewable sources to make gasoline and diesel greener. Injection of hydrogen into the gas network may be also very promising. However, it is important to mention that the gradual blending of hydrogen into the gas networks should be linked uh, to the results of compatibility checks of the existing gas infrastructure and, and customer plans. We believe there is a big opportunity in development and production of components for hydrogen technologies, starting with fuel cells, electrolysis, hydrogen tanks, and ending with hydrogen cars, buses, trucks, and railroad engines. The Czech Republic is in the forefront of EU automotive industry. Automotive represents nearly 10% of our GDP, and transition from gasoline and diesel drive to electricity and hydrogen is a big challenge and opportunity. The Czech Republic is located in the heart of Europe. It is an excellent place for living, but not the best for the location for hydrogen production from renewables. We have made the offshore wind generators, made the large areas with long sunshine. Therefore, the energy sources for production of green hydrogen are limited. From our point of view, it is important to keep all options open for hydrogen production, including hydrogen from natural gas with CTS and hydrogen produced by high temperature reactors. 
the common European journey to the hydrogen future will be challenging and will require a lot of effort in research, in manufacturing, in economy of the hydrogen production and in finding the right regulatory framework. Close international cooperation is the only way how we can successfully reach our common European goals. It is the reason why the Czech Republic welcomes the establishment of the EU Clean Hydrogen Alliance as a platform for effective international cooperation between member states and industries. We are looking forward to constructive and targeted cooperation with the EU Clean Hydrogen Alliance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, also for putting our uh, alliance in the context of previous uh, industrial revolutions. We now turn to our last speaker from a national government perspective, which is uh, Mr. Bruno Le Maire, Minister for Economy, Finance and Recovery. France is still in the process of developing and finalizing the hydrogen strategy. Minister, would you like to share some thoughts on this with us, please? Thank you. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, dear uh, Vice President Timmermans and dear Commissioner Breton, for uh, organizing this very timely event and launching the Clean Hydrogen Alliance that France fully supports. In the wake of the COVID-19 crisis, we have the duty to protect our strategic value chains and to make them shift towards greener path. And I think that this event is really committed to that. Those points are at the very core of the recovery plan that we have to build together for Europe. France fully agrees that clean hydrogen is a key in reaching carbon neutrality in 2050. By using all decarbonized electricity generation technologies in hydrogen production, the products and solutions delivered by this new ecosystem would meet the needs of our heavy industries to lower their carbon emission, as well as those of the mobility sector in a complementary way to batteries. And I'm very happy to see that following the initiatives that we have taken with my friend Peter Altmaier on electric car batteries, we are once again, France and Germany, Peter and myself, exactly on the same line for uh, supporting this hydrogen initiative. As far as the national perspective is concerned, we are still in the process of assessing the financial means that we will put on the hydrogen plan in the French recovery plan that should be presented by the president by the end of uh, this month. But uh, you can count on a very heavy support to the French national recovery plan to this new technology and to hydrogen. Because we think that hydrogen technologies can also contribute to the creation of industrial jobs in our territories. Hydrogen is, in that perspective, an opportunity to grow a new value chain and a leverage to deepen our economic sovereignty. The EU has the potential to place itself in the innovation race for the development of hydrogen technologies and its users. I would like to share with you my total commitment to take part in further cooperation and coordination on our efforts to build a sovereign, resilient and clean hydrogen industry. To this end, once again, I welcome the Clean Hydrogen Alliance, which should make it possible to coordinate the efforts of EU member states and European industry. I'm also calling on the European institutions to explore ways and means of financing the development of hydrogen technologies and of its users with European tools, and in particular, the possibilities of co-financing with member states consistently with both EU industrial and climate policies, because the single disadvantage of the hydrogen technology for now is that this is very costly, it requires a lot of energy, a lot of investment, and we clearly uh, need, as explained by uh, Peter, a national investment, but also the full support of uh, EU financial tools. A national strategy for hydrogen will be part of our economic recovery plan, as I just told you, but it will include also the support of an EPCEI program. That's why we are clearly looking forward to discuss further with you how to join our effort, as well as the possibility to initiate as soon as possible 
an NPCEI with the support of the Clean Hydrogen Alliance. I'm fully convinced that if we are able to put together the national financial efforts for hydrogen, like in Germany, like in France, and these European tools, we can take the lead on this new technology at the European level for the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. I now want to turn to the regions. There are 289 regions in Europe and 41 of them are part of a smart specialization platform called Hydrogen Valleys. Let's hear from them too. I would like to pass the floor to Minister Hohmann, who is Minister in uh, the Northern Netherlands. Can you join us, please? We want to achieve the ambitions of the hydrogen strategy and the European Green Deal. The very existence of this partnership shows that European regions play a key role in supporting the hydrogen sector. We are the link between the regions. We are the connection between regions, between countries, between industries. We are essential for scaling up by making connections. Connections between valleys, connections between regions. The Northern Netherlands Alliance participates together with Aragon, Normandy and auvergne rhone alpes as leading region in the European Hydrogen Valley Partnership, an interregional partnership from Norway to Bulgaria. The partnership promotes the production and deployment of clean hydrogen via renewable energy sources and its use in sectors such as industry feedstock, energy and transport. We as regions aim to increase supply, stimulate demand and contribute to creating a modern clean and green economy for the European energy demand. The launch of the Hydrogen Alliance is a major step forward in reaching the climate targets, but only with the involvement of regions and cities, this will be a success, because we connect. To illustrate, as the Northern Netherlands, we are the first recognized European hydrogen valley. Our region recently received support from the fuel cell and hydrogen joint undertaken to develop a fully functioning green hydrogen value chain in our region, so-called Heaven project. Within Heaven, we will develop the entire green hydrogen value chain, from production to filling stations, thereby supporting sectoral integration. From large-scale production of green hydrogen as raw material for the industry, as well as storage, transport and distribution. Moreover, Heaven is supporting the hydrogen application for energy supply for both built environment and mobility. And here Heaven is modeled on the hydrogen valley principle. Regional hydrogen valleys, geographically defined areas and regions, are the ones that are demonstrating the role of hydrogen in the future energy system, going further than an individual project. Within hydrogen valleys, regions and cities can link individual projects and start creating a dedicated local hydrogen ecosystem. This is the so-called valley, a regional model for a hydrogen economy. And hydrogen valleys are important in demonstrating the key stakeholders, the systemic role that hydrogen can play as future energy carrier, the missing link. They bring together local and regional demand and supply, creating a regional ecosystem. Hydrogen valleys are also the ones that can improve the business cases for fuel cell hydrogen deployments, achieving significant scale. In addition, hydrogen valleys are improving the hydrogen rollout with increased impact and visibility for deployment, making them a local center for growth in Europe. The hydrogen valleys build on regional experience, on local available expertise and industrial capacity, or they introduce the new technology to a region. The power of the Hydrogen Valleys Partnership is that their regional expertise comes together. The knowledge is shared and interregional connections are made and linking the added value of each individual valley in order to enhance each other. And the next step is linking the valleys together. Not only can regional hydrogen valleys contribute to further exploiting renewable resources for decarbonization across Europe, But by reutilizing the existing assets and infrastructure, they can help transform fossil-based regional economies from economic uncertainty towards continuous growth of a hydrogen-based economy. A regional hydrogen valley serves a blueprint of replication. And in this phase, the need for an EU-wide logistical infrastructures connecting the values becomes more evident. 
So we start with connecting knowledge and expertise, and we end by connecting by hydrogen pipelines. Already today, after one year since our partnership exists, we have managed to increase the number of our members to 40 regions and cities, and we are still growing. We are working hard to develop the technology readiness and the commercial availability of fuel cell hydrogen applications. And moreover, our partnership strives towards overcoming the lack of access to information and expertise in the field of hydrogen by facilitating matchmaking and co-investment between European regions. We are already moving through a deep decarbonization, replacing the fossil fuels working on hydrogen production process. We can decarbonize industry and other industries that are crucial, namely boats, ports, trains, long-distance coaches and valleys and islands. In our region, a consortium of businesses led by Shell, Gassoni and Groningen Seaports is working on the largest green hydrogen project in the world. It's called Nord H2. The sustainable energy is supplied by a mega wind farm offshore with a capacity of 4 gigawatts in a couple of years, and this must be expanded to 10 gigawatts. With Nord H2, the consortium wants to set up an integrated hydrogen chain of serious size, including the whole value chain. Production, transport and industry crossing borders. Let us do this on a European scale, connecting regions and, as Europe, remaining competitive as a continent. Today, it is crucial to stress that our added value is that we as regions can fund projects. Fuel cell hydrogen products planned by regions and cities represent the biggest share of the demand side for these technologies today. Moreover, in many member states, regional and local authorities are managing the European Structural and Investment Funds, especially the European Regional Development Fund. Also, regions are the stakeholders in making important projects of common European interest a reality. I also want to stress that regions are the entities that are gathering clusters and companies to create big hydrogen projects. It's our job to connect, and we can do that on a large scale. So I am very happy that the European Commission has launched this initiative because I believe that together with the industries, the national stakeholders and civil society, we can boost the development of a competitive clean hydrogen value chain across the European Union. Concrete projects and an ambitious investment agenda are needed, and we as regions have our projects ready for deployment. Hydrogen valleys are ready to facilitate a connection between the stakeholders of the Alliance and therefore, as a facilitator, would like to invite this high-level group to regularly meet in our hydrogen valleys and discuss the work and roadmaps where it all happens on the ground. Thank you very much and let's connect. Thank you very much, Minister, for showing uh, how regions are already very active in this uh, realm. I would now like to turn to a next group, which is our industry leaders from the different segments of the value chain. And I will start with Mr. Anzengruber, who is the CEO of Verbund in Austria. Mr. Anzengruber, would you like to join us, please? Good afternoon, dear commissioners, dear meeting participants. It's an honor for me to be part of this group of European hydrogen forerunners and to address you today on our ambitions for clean hydrogen production. I'm convinced that clean hydrogen will be an important piece to meet our climate targets. The foundation for a hydrogen economy is large-scale European hydrogen production. The crucial question is, how can we ensure sufficient production of clean hydrogen to allow us to become carbon neutral by 2050? On the one hand, this is a huge challenge. On the other, it is also a historic opportunity for Europe to take a technological leadership role and reduce its dependency on energy sources from outside Europe. The investments that we will make along the way will contribute to clean, sustainable, resilient and efficient economy and energy system. Scaling up an innovative new hydrogen manufacturing industry will create new green jobs and economic growth in Europe. The production of clean hydrogen will create high added value, contribute to decarbonization and benefit future generations. It is therefore of utmost importance for Europe, in particular in a post-COVID world. According to the ambitious 2030 scenario of the Hydrogen Roadmap Europe, the estimated annual hydrogen demand will be about 
17 million tons. One part of this hydrogen demand will be produced in the European Union, while the other will be imported. The two times 40 gigawatt green hydrogen initiative assumes that 7.4 million tons of hydrogen are supplied by renewable hydrogen, of which 4.4 million tons are produced in the European Union, while 3 million tons are imported from North Africa in Ukraine. This means that an additional 9.5 million tons of hydrogen need to be produced with the lowest carbon content possible. It is likely that the beginning of the transition renewable hydrogen will be complemented by low carbon hydrogen to meet the demand. However, in the long run, the majority of European hydrogen demand should be met by renewable hydrogen. Investments in the range of 220 billion euros by 2030 will be necessary in order to scale up hydrogen production to this level. For these investments to happen, it is of paramount importance that supply and demand are ramped up in a synchronized manner and that the electrolyzer industry in Europe is scaled up accordingly. Large-scale international initiatives such as the important projects of common European interest for hydrogen are essential to kickstart this process. Governments and companies around the world are stepping up their hydrogen investments. Europe has a historical opportunity to make an important contribution and expand its technological leadership position in this industry. Ladies and gentlemen, these are very ambitious goals. This is why we need to think outside the box. We need to think in a cross-sector way. We need to think about where to build production capacity. We need to think about which energy carrier we want to transport and how we want to transport it. We need to think in life cycles and analyze the carbon footprint of our actions accordingly. And we know that the clock is ticking. And let me be clear, no one can do this on their own. This is why it is so important that the Commission took the initiative to form the Clean Hydrogen Alliance and implement the ambitious European Union hydrogen strategy. Hydrogen production involves many players, from equipment manufacturers to plant operators, from researchers to users. Collaboration between partners along the value chain, decision makers and regulatory bodies across sectors and member state will therefore be more important than ever. This will enable us to quickly bounce back from the COVID-19 pandemic and make clean hydrogen production the foundation for a sustainable green recovery. My final message is the European industry is ready, but we will also need a strong political will and a favorable regulatory framework to achieve a truly sustainable hydrogen economy in Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, together with my co-chairs, Mr. Locke from Nell and Mr. Rechter from Resilient Ventures, we look forward to contributing to this outstanding initiative. We are willing to leverage the expertise of our organizations, of our industries, and of our countries in order to work for a clean and a sustainable hydrogen economy in Europe. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Mr. Ansen Gruber. And I would like now to turn to Mr. Alvera, who is the CEO of ISNAM, a gas transmission operator in Italy. Mr. Alvera, you have the floor. Thank you very much and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to participate in this and thank you for organizing this to the Commission and to uh, Jorgo. This is an excellent initiative. So I'm the CEO of SNAM. SNAM is uh, Europe's largest transporter of natural gas and storage company. We are indeed the largest in the world outside of Russia. We have not only our core business present in many countries representing what could be the future backbone for hydrogen, but we have also launched a number of startups for the energy transition. We have committed over one and a half billion of our own capital to these ventures in energy efficiency and biomethane, in sustainable mobility, building refueling stations, infrastructure for trains, and eventually for ships as well in ports. And then, of course, we have a hydrogen business unit as well. We've been working on this for four years now, and we've launched uh, the first Congress last year in October with around 70 companies from all over the world coming to Rome to talk about hydrogen. A lot has been said when we look at the market.
We are in this pillar together with Daniel Takeman from Hydrogenous Technologies and together with Costel Stanka from the port of Constanta. We uh, heard a lot about how the future uh, hydrogen will come from uh, the north, from offshore wind, and will come from the south in terms of North Africa. Many national hydrogen strategies that are being released uh, over the last few weeks include big volumes of imported hydrogen. And I'm pleased to say that Italy, in our own thinking, we will have big volumes of hydrogen to export towards Central and Northern Europe. This is the hydrogen produced in Italy, but also in North Africa. The reason we are firm believers in the opportunity to import into Italy and export out of Italy into the rest of Europe hydrogen from North Africa is that the cost is less than half of the cost for solar in Europe. And the cost of transporting hydrogen over pipelines is negligible. We estimate around two and a half to five dollars per megawatt hour to come to Italy. And when we look at the cost for transporting electricity is between five and ten times greater. And also liquid forms of hydrogen are expensive. In order to do this transport over long distances, we need to accommodate increasing percentages of hydrogen into our pipeline into this backbone that we are creating. We have been the first in the world to test a 10% blend in the high pressure, in the reduction valve, and the low pressure, all the way to two final users. We've been doing this for a period of a month to show that not only the pipeline system is capable of doing so, but also the plants and the end users are capable of accepting blends. We are working now on geological storage. We're working on membranes that can be very important to separate hydrogen and gas once they are blended. We have launched a new procurement strategy where everything that we buy has to be hydrogen ready. And we've done an audit on our pipelines and we are pleased to report that 70% of our underground pipelines are ready to take on hydrogen. We see blending as an intermediate step. We've already began working on the end game, which which is in 2050, having separate backbones for biomethane coming mainly from the north to the south and for hydrogen going, as I mentioned earlier, from the south to the north and then out of Europe for exports. In order to do this, we need to continue to work on the blending and we need to continue to work on the new technologies and new research. We have also the opportunity to smooth out the peaks as we generate hydrogen from areas where even in the winter there's quite a lot of sun. We have set out uh, what we need to work on, as requested at the beginning by Vice President Timmermans and the commissioners. We have summarized this in four points. The first is that we need to invest in technologies to have 100% hydrogen readiness in the backbones, in the networks, in the infrastructure. The second area is that we need, as Jorgo said, to create a big, liquid, large, uh, transparent European hub for hydrogen, a marketplace. We need to import hydrogen into Europe and we need to be able to move it easily around Europe. And we need to work together, northern countries and southern countries, at the end of the day, if it's a green hydrogen from the wind or green hydrogen from the sun or indeed in a transition period, also blue hydrogen. We need all of these hydrogens to work together and to define standards and certificates of origin so that we can trade this. The third point is that the whole value chain needs to be ready together. That's why initiatives like this are very important because we will be as weak as our weakest link. And finally, uh, we need a moonshot. We need something that people understand, that is visible, that is credible, that is bold. And we think the moonshot should be to move hydrogen costs from $6 today to $3 in five years' time. This can be announced that COP can be something that moves outside of Europe as well, bringing in third-party countries. And then we can commit to a price as low as $2 per kilogram by 2030, and then a price further lower than that, around $1.50 to $1 by 2050. The amount of public money needed is significant, but I think it will be a lot less than what we are currently estimating because the appetite from players like us and from financial investors to jump on this opportunity that has very significant business cases and availability of technologies that are being scaled up as we speak is significant. So we welcome this initiative. We're available to work with an open source approach on many of these ideas. In fact, we are already doing so in a collaborative spirit. So thanks again, and we're open for business. Thank you very much, Mr. Alvera. If the dollar could be expressed in euro, it would even be better, uh, the benchmark. I cannot uh, refrain from saying that. Thank you very much. Uh, we heard a lot about transport of hydrogen. Now uh, I'd like to turn to Florent Amenego, CEO of Michelin, 
to tell us maybe about how hydrogen can power transport and mobility. Thank you. And good afternoon, uh, dear audience and uh, dear commissioners. Uh, first of all, I would like to mention my two other transport pillar um, co-chairs, Mr. Jerry Marx, president of CNH Industrial Iveco, and Mr. Marcel Podolac, the CEO of Bioway. We all agree there is um, urgency to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in all sectors. Mobility, even though it's a fundamental right, also is responsible for 28% of the worldwide CO2 emissions. Therefore, we believe that electrification of the vehicle park is the way forward. And hydrogen is one of the solutions. Hydrogen is complementary to batteries and sometimes the most relevant solution for trucks, buses, trains, and this kind of heavy duty transport. Transport will be one of the first market to deploy hydrogen. So let us make transport an instrumental part of the Green Deal. That's why we really pay tribute to this very nice initiative. In comparison to the battery sector, all the players alongside the value chain are here already in Europe. The challenge is now for us to scale up hydrogen mobility. Hydrogen players are ready to contribute to building a strong value chain in Europe. I take a few examples. So Michelin, together with Forestia, we have created a joint venture around a company named Symbio, and we have already invested to build the first plant of uh, fuel cell systems in France. And our mission is to make Symbio a worldwide player in H2 fuel cell systems. At the end of 2019, a second example is CNH Industrial Brands, Iveco and, and FPT Industrial, entered into a strategic exclusive partnership with Nicola Corporations to accelerate industry transformations towards emission neutrality of trucks in Europe. And this joint venture will be the first to deliver H2 trucks. This is a race and we need to go fast. Important project of common interest, European interest, uh, IPCEI, is an excellent mechanism to boost European industrial competitiveness and support the scaling up of the European sector, starting with commercial vehicles, fuel cell trucks. BioWay Slovakia, clean tech transport and logistic company, is an innovator and coordinator of the biggest V4 countries IPCEI, Black Horse, which consists of deployment of 270 hydrogen refueling stations, production of green hydrogen, and the implementation of 10,000 hydrogen trucks by 2030, and upgradable for all type of hydrogen fuel cells vehicles. The investment in this project only is 5.8 billion euros. So a pan-European infrastructure is needed, is required. Firstly, we need to focus on strategically located infrastructure for commercial vehicles. Secondly, we need to scale up the number of hydrogen refueling stations fast to ensure a unified network in Europe. We need 3,700 hydrogen refueling stations to cover Europe and only 1,000 for trucks that will give ample room for development for the trucks. But the clean hydrogen price needs to be competitive, as my colleagues have said just before, it is very important that our target should be a total cost of ownership close to the diesel one. So hydrogen close to diesel, total cost of ownership. So ecosystems and corridors are one of the key success factors also to accelerate hydrogen mobility. We need to promote hydrogen valleys and which build up local and regional H2 value chains and integrated use of fuel chain technologies across different sectors and application, like uh, what has happened in auvergne and the other two representative of regions uh, in this forum. To favor the creation of hydrogen transport corridors, it is crucial that all European hydrogen players adopt a coordinated approach. We consider both European hydrogen strategy and the launch of the Clean Hydrogen Alliance to be major steps for achieving carbon neutrality and safekeeping key industrial sectors and jobs. And for all of us, our role is also to educate citizens and customers to the environmental benefits and the economic efficiency of hydrogen. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for this. And I now turn to another 
use case for hydrogen, which is uh, decarbonization of energy intensive industries. And it's my pleasure to give the floor to uh, Armin Artwig, who is a member of the board of Orlen. Could you join us, please? Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, dear commissioners. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, let me thank you for this unique opportunity to participate in this wonderful event and initiative. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, today our globally recognized industries need to master a great challenge, achieving climate neutrality. As most industrial processes will continue to rely on fossil fuels and gases in the coming years, hydrogen and its derivatives will be the key lever to reduce emissions and gradually reduce the use of fossil fuels. At the same time, it should be emphasized uh, that to take hydrogen projects from demonstration to industrial size, a stable uh, regularity framework and financial support as laid out in the blueprint hydrogen roadmap is required. Currently, there is no real economic incentive sufficient for industries and consumers to switch from fossil fuels to green hydrogen. As to the refineries, hydrogen use in refineries will pick up once the delegated acts on renewable electricity supply and GHG emission avoidance are solved constructively under the Renewable Energy Directive. Current applications of hydrogen in chemical processes may in the future be extended to the scope of energy production and storage. Further development of CCS and CCU technologies is necessary, as well as the need to build an integrated infrastructure enabling carbon dioxide transport and injection. Referring to the steel industry, steel plants need a mechanism to cover additional costs when turning to green hydrogen. A powerful instrument is carbon contracts for difference. As to the industrial infrastructure, by replacing fossil fuels and gases with renewable hydrogen and e-fuels, existing infrastructure across Europe can remain in place for further usage, avoiding stranded assets and major new infrastructure investment. Generally speaking, construction of a stable hydrogen economy should begin based on currently produced hydrogen, followed by a gradual transition to low carbon and green hydrogen. We could enable investments by sharing risk, for example, through providing financial support for the demonstration of new technologies or allowing for state aid. Ken Orlan, Sunfire and SAP as members of the governing board and ready to deliver projects at industrial scale. The priority direction considered by Piquen Orlan is the production of hydrogen in electrolysis processes powered by electricity from renewable energy sources. Orlan is currently implementing a project to construct a hydrogen purification installation for the needs of fuel cells used in transport and to build the first hydrogen refueling station in Poland. Sunfire, as a leading provider of electrolyzers, and a project developer for green hydrogen projects has already started the realization of a, a synthetic aviation fuel plant and a green steel plant with an overall combined target of 550 megawatts installed capacity. Saab is taking the lead in decarbonizing the steel industry, which has been mentioned before. Thanks to hybrid technology, Saab aims to be the first steel company in the world to bring fossil-free steel to the market already in 2026. To stay competitive and meet climate targets, Saab has chosen the route of hydrogen-based steel making and aims to replace coking oil with fossil-free electricity and green hydrogen. As a member of the Clean Hydrogen Alliance, together with my colleagues from Saab, Sunfire and other European companies, we will put effort to support lawmakers to get the regulatory barriers removed in order to realize the ambitious European hydrogen investment agenda. Therefore, as Speaker Norland, we also hope that the Polish government will be included in the work of the Clean Hydrogen Alliance. This is particularly important in the context of yesterday signing in Warsaw a letter of intent between the Ministry of Climate and key national entities interested in the development of the hydrogen economy to take joint actions to implement the sectoral agreement on cooperation for the development of the hydrogen economy in Poland, including hydrogen and domestic technologies value chain. Thank you for your attention. 
Thank you very much for uh, this information. And we move on to another industry case. I'm happy to invite Han Finema, CEO of Gasuni, to join us. Could you come in, please? Good afternoon, everybody. Many thanks to the European Commission for this unique launch of the Clean Hydrogen Alliance. As Gasuni, we are delighted to be here today. Together with my colleagues in the energy sector pillar, Mr. Christian Brug from Siemens Energy and Mr. Gunnar Gröbler from Vattenfall, we're looking forward to work with all of you in achieving the climate, energy, and industrial objectives through the use of hydrogen. I will make my intervention short and to the point. We do want to get going. On behalf of Christian Gunnar and myself, I would like to bring forward three messages. My first message. We have agreed on three guiding principles that will guide us along this hydrogen journey in the energy sector pillar. The first guiding principle will be carbon performance first. We aim at ensuring CO2 reduction and increased decarbonization of the economy and society with the most favorable societal cost for the total energy system. This requires technology openness and going beyond our individual value chances. As a second guiding principle, volumes, volumes, volumes. We look at improving sustainable and secure energy supplies. On the generation side, with offshore wind to supply green electricity for electrolysis and by cross-border trade of carbon neutral energy in the form of hydrogen via pipelines and by harnessing the world's most competitive spots for wind and solar energy and importing them in the most efficient way, probably from south from the Middle East or north of Africa. The third guiding principle will be European industrial leadership. Our ambition is to build a new competitive industry and increase investments into the establishment of a hydrogen economy in Europe. I see our work here as a joint mission. As Mr. Altmaier has stated, decisions for decades. Like in the 60s, when we put the first man on the moon, our learning of the successes that Airbus brought, creating industrial leadership at European level. These three principles guide our work, bring together a variety of companies with different backgrounds, with a clear common objective. We will prioritize the close to market opportunities and build on the strategic forum report on strategic value change for a future ready EU industry and the European hydrogen strategy released today. My second message, aligned with the sector integration strategy, we see a very strong link between the energy pillar and the other pillars. We want to promote projects and highlight funding and financing and regulatory barriers that cover the entire value chain as we have this important integration role. Secondly, we want to look beyond the hydrogen sector to ensure accelerated investments in renewable sources. It will be key to ensure sufficient volumes of hydrogen by fully leveraging the offshore wind potential and by conceiving strategies to harness the world's best spots for wind and solar energy. My third message is today, speed, organization and cooperation. Since we received the invitation mid of last week, our companies have got to work. Our joint contribution today is the first result and the three of us are meeting in August to get our pillar going. We will come up with concrete proposals and a clear way forward at the EU Hydrogen Annual Forum. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Christian, Gunnar and myself, thank you for the confidence and task you have entrusted us with. We are ready to work together to ramp up the hydrogen economy in Europe and to bring forward suitable project pipelines. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this um, get going. I will retain that. I now pass the floor to our last uh, CEO perspective, Mr. Denner, CEO of Bosch. Will you join us, please? Yes, thank you very much. I would like to congratulate the European Commission on today's launch. It's very good to see that the EU has made a strong statement towards hydrogen. And with the Hydrogen Alliance, it will set an important foundation for a successful implementation of a European hydrogen economy and in turn bring Europe closer to climate neutrality by 2050. For this reason, I would also like to thank you for appointing Bosch in the Hydrogen Alliance. It's an honor to be part of this story.
My colleagues and co-chairs Konstantinos Xifaras from the Public Gas Corporation of Greece and Andreas Pichler from Solid Power extend their greetings and gratitude as well. We would also like to acclaim the fact that the initiative is not solely limited to a specific region in Europe, but has a pan-European character, highlighting even more the importance and the acknowledgement of hydrogen being the enabler of the energy transition in order to meet climate goals. In our view, climate action policy should not be merely defensive or indeed restrictive. We promote a technology offensive approach where the move to alternative energy goes hand in hand with a move to alternative fuels, even beyond hydrogen to so-called e-fuels. This means boldly embracing the hydrogen economy and doing it now. This climate action policy is also a policy for economic growth. It benefits the environment without neglecting prosperity. And yes, climate action costs money, but doing nothing will cost even more. Referring to the chapter I'm representing today, ambitions on hydrogen in residential applications, I as well as Mr. Xifaras and Mr. Pichler believe hydrogen is a strong enabler for sectoral integration and should therefore not be limited to specific sectors and be made available for mobility, heat and industry applications. At Bosch, we are preparing for the use of hydrogen in heat generation. We expect the share of hydrogen in the natural gas network to rise over the long term. Moreover, as millions of homes are connected to this network, gas-fired boilers will have to be made future-proof. Already today, our existing gas boilers are able to process up to 10% share of hydrogen in the gas network. With a clear political signal, this could increase to 20% within five years. Our portfolio even includes industrial boilers that are 100% hydrogen ready. Stationary fuel cells have started commercialization in the residential sector and will also soon be coming into commercial use for supplying data centers and industrial facilities with electricity. By 2030, we forecast that the market volume for fuel cell power plants will be more than 20 billion euros. In the end, a successful move to a hydrogen economy is also important for the future of our company and for many European companies. We are making ourselves hydrogen ready as just described. Bosch also prepares to manufacture mobile fuel cell stacks for the use of hydrogen in vehicles, especially for trucks, but also for passenger cars. Likewise, our engineers are developing powertrain technologies that can be fueled. I'm afraid we lost Mr. Denner, but in his intervention he pulled together the different applications and use cases. Can I give the floor to Mrs. Walburga Himmelsberger, CEO of Solar Power Europe? Yes, thank you very much. Dear commissioners, dear ministers, good afternoon everyone. It's a real pleasure to attend the kickoff meeting of the Clean Hydrogen Alliance. Before I start my intervention, I just want to tell you that I'm not speaking only as the CEO of Solar Power Europe, but also in the name of my dear colleague Charles Dixon, CEO of Wind Europe, and in the name of the whole Choose Renewable campaign, which brought together some 27 companies and organizations from the renewable industry, amongst which major European uh, utilities such as, for example, Enel, EDP, Ipatrola, or Ørsted. Without any doubt, uh, wind and solar will be the core pillars of the European energy transition, and I think we don't have to discuss that. And that is not least because today they are just the most affordable energy sources. And they're already today creating long-term jobs, almost half a million already today. Renewables have a proven track record, and they are very scalable to achieve the full decarbonization. And let me be clear here, more than 60% of final energy consumption can be covered by direct electrification of final energy uses, such as transport, heating and buildings, industrial pro processes, uh, not to mention the least. And all of that can be based on renewables. But obviously, there's still a way to go and we still have a lot of work to do. And in going forward, we think that two ideas will have to be quit. So the first one is we need to quit the idea that solar can only be harvested in the south and wind energy only in the north. So, Yorgo, at some point you have to redraw your map you've been showing in the very beginning. Wind and solar resources in Europe are significant and remain largely untapped and that all across European regions. 
And the second idea uh, we will have to quit is that more hydrogen means less need of electricity grids. Because an energy transition which wants to succeed will need more direct electrification and will therefore also require to develop further the electricity grid. Now, if we are ambitious, and that's what we want to be in the deployment of renewables in Europe, we will also enable the production of CO2-free and cost-competitive renewable hydrogen. And this is opening up a whole new industrial opportunity for our sectors. Electrolyzers using 100% renewable electricity, they are key to bringing forward the competitive decarbonization of those sectors, which are difficult to electrify. And we all know it's uh, energy-intensive industries, it's aviation, it's shipping. So hydrogen, from our perspective, is not an end. And I want to echo what Minister Altmaier said earlier today. It is the missing link. Therefore, we must focus on the end uses that cannot be directly electrified. We need a homegrown and fully sustainable European hydrogen strategy. And renewables are the raw material for that. And we all want a green deal made in Europe. Therefore, a successful industrial policy for renewable hydrogen from our perspective, requires to also accelerate on industrial policy for renewables. A strong home market, a competitive access to finance, R&D, ensuring we remain the global leaders, and smart trade policies, which will allow us to remain competitive by, at the same time, drawing, of, obviously, on a global supply chain. And investors need visibility. Investors always need visibility. Therefore, we would really want to congratulate the European Commission for explicitly acknowledging today when we speak about clean hydrogen, what we really mean is renewable-based hydrogen produced from wind and produced from solar sources. This renewable hydrogen must now be the core focus of the upcoming pool measures and industrial upscaling and uh, R&D when it comes to hydrogen. So we, wind and solar, we are ready to build on our flourishing renewables industries to develop a robust and competitive EU electrolyzer industry. And um, I'm sorry, I think we lost you, your voice. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we lost you at the last part of it, but the big message came across very well. Thank you. And that concludes the series that we had for our CEO perspectives. I would now like to turn to the civil society. I would like to invite Mr. Wendel Triu, the Director of Climate Action Network Europe, to join us. Mr. Triu, can you yes. come in? Thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this extremely important debate. I think that representing over 170 climate and energy NGOs in Europe, we are very interested to engage in this conversation. For us, this is part of the implementation of the Paris Agreement. And as you know, in uh, the Paris Agreement, governments have agreed that they want to avoid um, irreversible climate change and for that make efforts to limit temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. That is quite a challenge. We know that by now. And in order to do that, a number of organizations have made clearly interesting contributions. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, for instance, has said that if we want to achieve 1.5 degrees, the global um, emissions will need to go to net zero by 2050. And of course, we're expecting the European Union to do better than the global one. The UN Environment Programme said that in order to limit temperature rise to 1.5 degrees, global emissions will need to be reduced annually by 7.6% a year between now and 2030. So all of that sounds extremely challenging. It is unprecedented. That's also when all the scientists says, but it is not impossible. And that's why we as NGOs launched last week our own scenario for a just transition of the energy sector in Europe um, and how that can happen between now and 2050. In that scenario, indeed, hydrogen plays a role. And in particular for what has been said before, for the hard to abate sectors, industry, aviation, shipping, etc. But those are the key ones. But that is only possible and hydrogen can only play its role if we actually deal with kind of the four main pillars of this transition. One is an unprecedented upscale of renewable energy production in Europe. Secondly, also unprecedented reduction of energy consumption. We can have energy consumption by half by the middle of this century. It's an increase of electrification 
and it's a commitment to phase out fossil fuels in Europe. Those are kind of the four key pillars. And that's in this context, we see a future for hydrogen. And it's very clear that for us, when we speak about hydrogen of the future, we only speak of hydrogen based on renewable energy. And that's the only one that we believe that this alliance should be focusing on. For us, we clearly see the Hydrogen Alliance as a tool that can help us to make this unprecedented uh, transition, as a tool that can help us to ensure that we have hydrogen available from renewable energy um, in the future. But we need to see how the uh, Hydrogen Alliance can really do that. We notice from the speakers before that there's a strong representation from industrial sectors into the Alliance, some of those which might lead to potential conflicts of interest when we speak about guidelines for investments, when we speak about projects of common interest, etc., etc. And there um, we as civil society are actually willing to help out in overcoming that conflict of interest and actually presenting the interest of society but that would need that we as civil society are well represented in all the different elements of this alliance, uh, including in its governance structures. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's clear. I would like to pass the floor to Patrick Denbrink from the European Environmental Bureau, who will complement the civil society perspective. Mr. Okay. Denbrink, you are there? Yes, yes, I'm there. Thanks very much for today's invitation. Um, at the EB, we represent 163 organizations and 30 million people. And we've also talked quite widely among various different NGOs, the G10. And so I'll share these points on behalf of, all, of this wider group. I wanted to focus on three points. One is on the fuels and technologies, about the risks and choices. Another, a couple of comments about today's hydrogen strategy and the energy system integration strategy. And then finally, a couple of points on the governance issues about the clean uh, hydrogen alliance and building on what Wenda said. So first, we very much welcome the focus on renewable hydrogen. If produced sustainably using renewable electricity, then it can be a strong ally in the race for climate carbon neutrality. Only hydrogen that is produced by electrolysis using renewables can be defined as clean. And we very much welcome that the Commission has recognized that only true hydrogen is green hydrogen and also the positive commitments made to promote renewables hydrogen and the wider decarbonization narrative embraced by all speakers. It's probably worthwhile noting that fossil hydrogen which is seen as a transition fuel and the strategy is a completely different technology and which still implies that we will use fossil fuels. In addition, there are sub sub additional substantial risks like CCS, leakage, questions of origin, quality of imported green hydrogen that will be difficult to govern. Also with issues of cost, opportunity costs, where to use public money, issues of proven commercial technical viability, as well as whether wider governance challenge of citizen risks and acceptation. So there are some challenges and some choices which in the wider narrative we haven't really seen, but I wanted to underline this because it's important we're aware of this. In reality, also, given costs and other issues, the potential for hydrogen from renewable electricity, while significant and very important, will be arguably less than some people hope and some people plan with. And it is will be a an important fuel, but maybe not a the important fuel and not right for parts of society. So we have to use it in a very targeted way and ensure that we use renewable hydrogen in hard to abate sectors, not in residential heating, but in sectors that cannot move to electrification. If we overestimate the hydrogen potential, there's a risk for climate and the consumer and we'll end up using fossil hydrogen and much more than just for the transition role. So the real focus implicitly in the various strategies is a choice question is where to put the money. Do we put it into renewables or CCS? Do we focus on electrification or the use of green or not so green hydrogen and associated infrastructure? Our view is clear, and I think Vendel already mentioned it. We need to put the energy on the penetration of renewables and focus on embracing targeted renewable hydrogen. So we should also be super careful about making sure that subsidizing hydrogen doesn't distort markets, other markets, whether it's energy efficiency, electrification, other solutions are as well a better place to deliver, because that would lead to cost ineffective solutions. We have to be very careful about the public purse. Just on that, and then a quick now comment on the hydrogen strategy and the energy system integration strategy. In this, it seems to me that there's only 84% renewables by 2050. So there's a, still an assumption that fossil fuels will be part of our energy system in 2050. And hence that in the strategy, the Commission therefore paves the way for the production of fossil-based hydrogen, which we think create undermines the climate neutrality target and the Green Deal. And in the transition period, it is assumed that we will create low-cost hydrogen to kickstart the market and to pave the 
way forward. But if we do this, we risk locking in fossil fuels, infrastructures, and using money that could be arguably be better used for renewable-based hydrogen, which is the stated ambition. So there's a contradiction that may undermine the stated ob- objective. Then we get on the wider issue of governance on the Green Clean Hydrogen Alliance. It was mentioned earlier by a speaker that this is the new industrial revolution, and decarbonization is a whole societal revolution, societal transformation. So we need to make sure the governance system and the governance process takes into account the whole of societal interests at all relevant stakeholders. So the Clean Hydrogen Alliance has proposed to play an important role. But we, as Wendel said, we see there's some risks of a conflict of interest by granting industry undue influence. Um, No other alliance in the past has had quite such a strategic role in the past. I should underline that we're not against industry. We, of course, need industry to have its say and to act. But we need to spend money in the right way. We need to focus on how effectively we can achieve carbon neutrality. We need to be aware of the risks and focus on the measures that really create the transition that we need. So this needs to focus on green hydrogen where we can be cost effective and needed, renewables and electrification, electric energy efficiency and circular economy. So as we have one fundamental concern then is to make sure there's a balance of representation in this new alliance and we can be inspired by existing governance processes like expert groups that have got rules of transparency, participation, etc. And we can also be inspired by other alliances like the Battery Alliance. Finally, just to underline it, we need more academic science representation. We do need a representation of renewables, green hydrogen producers, youth representation given intergenerational issues, and of course, civil society. And maybe we can be inspired by the H2 Advisory Council in Germany, which includes a number of very good organizations like Klima Alliance, Born Zirkwood. Institute and others. So to summarize, we need to focus on renewable hydrogen, be realistic, how much can produce cost effectively and where it should be used. We should not use the hopes of clean hydrogen to let in fossil-based hydrogen. We have a good narrative and we need to make sure that the measures and processes support the ambition to create conditions to undermine it. We're here to work together to achieve our common and ambitious goals. Thank you very much. Thank you very much also for highlighting how important it is for everybody to uh, work together on this. This will be the key to success. We haven't spoken about workers and employees, and I'm very happy to give the floor now to Judith Kirsten Darling, newly appointed Deputy Secretary General of Industry and All Europe. Judith, please can you thank come Thank you. Up? Yeah, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Thrilled to be here to be part of the launch of uh, this alliance, Industrial Europe strongly welcomes the launch of the Clean Hydrogen Alliance and the Hydrogen Strategy as part of the Green Deal and as part of a comprehensive industrial strategy for Europe. And we hope um, that we will also have this as an element in an ambitious European recovery programme, because representing workers across Europe's manufacturing, energy and mining sectors, it's clear that our members are really in the eye of the storm of not only the current COVID crisis and the economic impact of COVID, but also the challenges of decarbonisation. Um, estimates range that around 11 million industrial workers' lives will be transformed by decarbonisation plans. And those aren't jobs which will be necessarily lost. There will be some jobs lost, but there will be an awful lot of jobs which are transformed across the industries that we represent. And we see hydrogen as a key, although I uh, recognise the point uh, made by Wendell, not necessarily the only, or maybe it was uh, Mr. Dunbrink, uh, not only technology, but a key technology in the decarbonisation puzzle for many of the sectors in which our members work, whether it's the decarbonisation of energy intensive industries such as chemicals, steel, cement, whether it's in mobility and uh, transport equipment sectors, ships, cars, buses, trains or heating. We recognise that there are significant employment opportunities in the hydrogen value chain, new jobs in hydrogen production and infrastructure. But for us, the greater goal is also retaining good employment in our existing industries and transforming those industries, securing Europe's role potentially in the future as the low carbon and low emissions workshop of the world leading on technology. We see hydrogen as a technology which is crucial to support the technological change in wider industrial production. And we already have examples to be inspired by linking 
projects which link renewable energy to existing industrial production plants, uh, particularly those converting to produce low carbon automotive or aviation fuels and low carbon cement and steel. So for us, job creation and job maintenance are of paramount importance, and they will be for us one of the indicators of the success of this alliance or um, the weakness of this alliance. This alliance will be an opportunity to demonstrate in a proactive and positive way that a just transition is really possible in the pursuit of our collective goal of carbon neutrality. But to do that, unions must be actively involved in the discussion within Europe. And that is a vital part of the European Union's Just Transition jigsaw puzzle. We have good examples in terms of governance. Uh, Reference was already just made the German Hydrogen Council, in which Industrial Europe's president and president of German Chemical and Energy uh, Union, IGBZE, Michael Vassiliadis, is a member. Equally, we have good examples of union engagement in research, development and demonstration. We've heard a lot about clean steel today. And in Sweden, whether it's through the electrolysis projects of the Ulkos program or through regional research and development, local unions have been key partners in projects like the Stepwise project financed through the Europe. A European Horizon 2020 programme that's led to the construction of plants converting gas from blast furnaces into hydrogen and nitrogen rich fuel, uh, for example, at the Sweria MEFOS site. Workforce engagement isn't just a would like to have, isn't just something that uh, should be seen as um, social washing of a project. But workforce engagement is actually a vital means of ensuring societal acceptance of key technological change and societal transformation. It's about engaging those who are most directly affected by uh, technological change in the same way that regional engagement and strategies around engaging local populations is, is vital, the broader social acceptance. Now, I think a lot has already been said. We know what many of the problems are at the moment. Currently, there's not enough hydrogen being produced. Where it is produced, it's predominantly grey hydrogen based on fossil fuels. Therefore, it's absolutely essential for us that we recognise that we need sustained EU policy also to deal with that grey hydrogen and carbon capture use and storage solutions as part of an overall European comprehensive framework. There's not enough demand for hydrogen either, and that needs not just market solutions, but full government intervention in our view. And we see this European strategy as a key means of ensuring that public policy framework to push forward the demand. So I was very reassured in the opening of this alliance to hear the vision set out by Federal Minister Altmaier of a comprehensive and proactive industrial policy toolbox to support the rollout of hydrogen in Europe. We see this as absolutely vital because what we're watching as European workers is other nations around the world bringing forward multi-billion euro job creating hydrogen strategies. And we recognise that this is a technology race. And Europe hasn't always won the technology races in moving towards a decarbonised economy. And we feel that we must be on the front foot of this technology race for all of the reasons and the industries that have uh, spoken earlier. We can't afford to be left behind. Failure would, in our view, result in a major backlash against our climate obligations that we are fully subscribed to and our joint commitments. And it would also mean a loss of highly skilled and quality jobs in Europe. So for us, today's launch, the strategy and this alliance are vitally important for Europe's industrial and energy workforce. And I can only say that we as the trade union movement are here to play our role as fully and as actively as we can. And I would subscribe to the comments made by the previous speakers from the Environmental Bureau and from Can Europe about governance and ensuring 
that uh, we as civil society actors are involved at every stage in the development of this strategy. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Judith, also for highlighting how much our workforce and their skills are necessary to manage uh, this transition. Now, we are lacking one final perspective here, which is the perspective of the investor. And uh, it's my great pleasure to announce Ambroise Fayol, Vice President of the EIB, who will be able to inform us how the energy lending policy, the new, brand new energy lending policy of the EIB, will be able to help in this hydrogen alliance. Uh, Ambroise, can I ask you to take the floor? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Kirsten. I hope you can hear me well and uh, Perfectly. Be brief, uh, not to be brief, not to be cut. <laughs> And I must say that together with the, the announcement of the hydrogen strategy, the first meeting of the Alliance, the launch of the Alliance, uh, establishes from today uh, a clear vision of building a whole hydrogen ecosystem for a climate neutral uh, Europe. And I would like to thank very much the Commission, the three commissioners uh, who spoke in the opening statement uh, for, for, for this. Uh, we share the Commission's view that the hydrogen's advantages, uh, notably its energy density and uh, its compatibility with existing uh, infrastructure, could make it an attractive fit for the de decarbonization of hard to abate transport and, and industrial sector. The Bank uh, of the European Union, the EIB, has uh, acknowledged the importance of low carbon hydrogen in its uh, new energy lending policy, as you referred to, Kerstin and has supported in the last year's already some 2 billion euros of projects aiming at uh, the development and demonstration of hydrogen-related technologies as well as the scale-up of deployment in the transport sector, uh, especially by supporting new hydrogen fleet and related infrastructure. But with the, the aim to become the climate bank of the European Union, EIB remains very much committed to continuing its support to investment in clean hydrogen, in line with the indications of the EU taxonomy, ranging from the needed research and development to demonstration projects, as well as the build-up of the necessary dedicated infrastructure. To finish, I would like to say that we know that low-carbon hydrogen projects carry high commercial and implementation risks. To deal with that, I think it will be very important to find the right um, blending of instruments and financial solutions that we have actually uh, been able to deal with uh, the European Commission. For example, uh, enough fin projects or uh, creating your facility. So we need to develop this also uh, for hydrogen. And finally, I would just like to say that advisory will be a very important role in, uh, in developing the hydrogen strategy and projects. And of course, here we are also uh, very much willing to team up with the European Commission to provide uh, input in the future investment agenda for hydrogen. I'll stop there, Kerstin, but many thanks for the invitation and very happy to see the momentum and to see the ambition and very pleased to announce that we will support it as much as we can. Thank you, Kerstin. Thank you very much, Ambroise. Uh, it's good to be able to count on the uh, EIB, uh, the Bank of the EU, on our side for this new venture. That takes us to the end of this event. Thank you to all speakers. You have made a very compelling case why one should join uh, the European uh, Hydrogen Alliance. So, what's the next steps now? First of all, we have a website, a dedicated website, and you can endorse the Hydrogen Alliance by signing up to it and have your company or your community, your organization, your association registered as an endorser and supporter of the European Hydrogen Alliance. Or, that's the other option, you can sign up to get and get involved. Get going, as one of the speakers said, in the concrete work to make the alliance happen and the project. To discuss the blueprint, to identify the part of broad hydrogen value chain where you fit in and engage to make it happen. We expect these more detailed discussions to start after the summer break. We are also planning the first EU Hydrogen Forum to take place on the 26th and 27th of November here in Brussels. Of course, we hope to see the blueprint of the Hydrogen Alliance already turning into an investment plan. Not everything will be in place and some challenges are to be expected, but the picture should be much clearer by then. This will create predictability and scale, which was mentioned, for investors who are also hopefully listening to our event there. I would like to thank all of you for having joined, all of you who have been listening in or watching, and I do apologize for the two or three glitches that we had, apparently unavoidable, but I'm very happy to continue, and we're all happy to continue the conversation and the collaboration around the European Clean Hydrogen Alliance. Thank you very much.